This is not a, a forward-looking talk, Pete. I'm not a forward-looking guy. <laughs> and, and I often wondered why, and, I, and I, the only thing I can say, I always seem to know what to do next. And if you know what to do next, you don't have to look very far ahead. <laughs> uh, but, 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 ladies and gentlemen, I've made a lot of mistakes. And those mistakes were really important to make in terms of uh, somehow incorporating uh, the hazards of the next step into, into uh, what I did. Uh, Hayek's laboratory was the great socialist debate. And by that I mean that was the, the arena in which, he, in which he asked important questions and, and worked out really quite incredible uh, answers. And uh, Hayek was a a master, I would say, of the mental experiment. And David Hume was a master of that, and, 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 a, and a great master was Adam Smith, and a contemporary of uh, Hayek, who was a master of the mental experiment, is Albert Einstein. Uh, some of us are not that great at mental experiments. We have to do real ones uh, in order to discipline our thinking and, and make mistakes and, and correct them. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to begin with and talk a little about competition as a discovery process uh, in the laboratory. <clears throat> uh, and I... Israel said if he was going to teach introductory economics, he would teach supply and demand. Uh, and uh, he, he wouldn't start with Austrian economics. Well, I had that problem. Uh, I finished my PhD at Harvard in 1955. And my first uh, appointment was at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. And in the fall semester of 1955, I taught principles of economics. And what I discovered that semester was that I didn't know anything at all about the connection between what people do in markets and the supply and demand that I was teaching. It wasn't part of my education. You know, I could bend the curves as well as anybody and tell stories about them. But I didn't really, really understand that. And so I decided to, in, uh, the next semester, in January 1956, in my first uh, class, I would do uh, an experiment, OK? And this was a mob of buyers. The, the, uh, Participants in that class, I had 22 of them. I remember it like it was yesterday. And uh, I, half of them I made buyers, and I assigned them private secret values that only each of them knew. And the other half were sellers, and I assigned them costs uh, that each of them knew. And uh, I decided to use... I went to the library to find out how they trade at the Chicago Board of Trade and the New York Stock Exchange. And I read about the double auction, OK? Uh, what are the message? What's the message space? Bid, ask, acceptance. That's the message space, Eric. And. Uh, <clears throat> So I decide if there's anywhere in the world a competitive market, surely it's those Chicago and, and the New York Stock Exchange markets. So I implemented that uh, mechanism. And to my astonishment, 
the contract prices converge to very close to the competitive equilibrium. Nobody in that class knew anything about supply and demand. They didn't know anything about double auction trading. Uh, but I motivated the buyers to buy, uh, buy low and the sellers to sell high. And uh, the results really falsified the belief that full information is necessary in a market. And you understand I was brought up to believe that stuff. Uh, why, why, and I didn't expect this market to work. Why would I believe the market, this market would work? My mother was a socialist and I had a Harvard education. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I thought there was something wrong with the experiment, okay? Uh, and I get that all my life. I, I report the experimental results, and, and people, they don't like it. There must be wrong, something wrong with the experiment. Well, of course, there can be something wrong with the experiment. That's always a, a possibility. And I thought, well, it was an accident of the symmetry of the supply and demand. So the average value, the average cost in, the, in, in that system turned out uh, that I'd assigned people turned out to be equal to price. So I went over to an a asymmetric design uh, in the next semester. Well, that one converged too. So I kept up these exercises, and I gradually, my students disabused me of the idea that anyone had to have comp full information in a market. So this was an incredible learning experiment, and uh, or exercise, and I ultimately generalized this very considerably. We went to other institutions, posted offer pricing by sellers. The dynamics are different, the conter con convergence paths are different, but it converges, okay? And uh, seal bid, offer auctions, crosses, and that sort of thing, and they started out pretty sloppily, but they converge, okay? And then we went to very ultimately to very complex markets in various stages. The system was becoming more and more open, okay, as we, uh, we um, uh, I expanded our horizon to more complex worlds. 35 years later, uh, I was going to New Zealand and Australia in connection with the liberaliz liberalization of electric power. Uh, Stephen Rossani, a colleague of mine, a systems engineer who is still a colleague of mine and, and is a great economist, but his PhD is in systems engineering. We went to Australia together. We were taken by a coalition, we were taken to Australia by a coalition of buyers. The uh, electric power industry was, uh, was owned by each of the states. And uh, the buyers were, especially the commercial industrial buyers, were, were, were sort of in revolt over that. So they brought us because we, we had gotten a, some reputation as a result of a, of a study we did for the Arizona Corporation Commission in which we recommended that they just spin off the generation, uh, decentralize it, spin it off in Arizona, create the Arizona Energy Exchange and have wholesale buyers and sellers bid into it. Uh, they thought we were stark raving mad. Uh, but they had asked us to look at alternatives to rate of return regulation. That's what we were doing. Well, that report fell on deaf ears in Arizona, not completely in the United States. We ended up doing work for Ohio Edison and some other companies. But it really took, uh, drew the attention of some foreign countries that owned their electric power systems and their treasuries were hurting and they wanted to do something about it. You know, Margaret Thatcher sold electric power uh, na uh, denationalization because it would help the British treasury, uh, not because of any commitment to decentralized processes in, in the abstract. That was the way it was, it was sold. Uh, and, and, you know, the interesting thing about uh, these uh, 
trips to New Zealand and Australia is that almost no one that we talked to believed that you could organize the electric power industry around uh, markets. And I'll never forget in New Zealand, uh, I gave a talk and a woman stood up and she said, you know, you, this cannot be done. She says, I know, I'm an engineer. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I'm an engineer too and I know exactly what you're, where you're coming from. I once believed that too. Uh, what we were able to do is put the people that didn't believe you could make a market in electric power into experiments. And guess what? They made markets in electric power and they work really quite well as a simple three node network. Uh, they work quite, quite well. Then they had to tell us what it was they did why they were able to make a market if you can't do it. Uh, it's incredible. That puts the burden of proof on the skeptics, see? And they, and they, <laughs> they couldn't answer. Uh, they couldn't answer that. And so uh, we, one little next step at a time, we kind of, uh, in a series of battles, more or less uh, uh, won that war. But you know, they, they uh, uh, to come back to what Eric said, it, it, it was a, it, we had, to, they had to know what to do on the ground. What was the engineering, you see? And, and because we had this uh, practice in the lab, and it's okay, there might be something wrong with the experiment. They can tell us what's wrong with the experiment. These are the people who are gonna make a market, okay? They can tell us, and we'll see if we can, we can handle that. Okay. But anyway, back to the, those early experiments, the convergence was really inexplicable by the microeconomic theory of the day. And uh, I, not knowing what Eric was going to talk about, I anticipated him. Uh, of course, uh, when I went to Purdue, I had an incredible colleague. His name was Stanley Ryder. Uh, and he uh, had been a, he was a student of Leo Hurwitz. Roy Radner would come in. We, we, we had these decentral, decentralization workshops in the late 50s and up in, the, up in the 60s. And I was not an integral part of that, but I was doing experiments and, and kind of influenced very much by what was going on around me. So we didn't have any way to come to terms with what the spontaneous order that people were generating in these uh, laboratory experiments. You know, we had the Cunaro model going clear back to 1838, but there wasn't any, any, uh, any price discovery processes. Now the game theorists were sort of baffled. They would ask me, uh, well now, are all those contracts you planted there in sequence, are they all bunched up at the end? I said, no, they're pretty well spread out. Well, they found that kind of amazing because no one had any information. So everyone, it was optimal to wait. I'll let somebody else move first. Okay? And well, that's not what did. Uh, th they did. And by the way, if you put game theorists in the experiments, they don't all wait to the end. They get in there and trade. <laughs> you know, uh, otherwise they'd, ne they'd never get into the supermarket to, 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 to <laughs> imagine. In a supermarket, you've got, what, maybe you've got tens of thousands of items. Think of all the different combinations of things you can buy in a supermarket. It's more, it's more different possibilities than there are atoms in the universe. It's mind-blowing how big it is. We well, don't have to know all about that. You can go on and, you know, we all manage to get along pretty good in those environments. Um, <clears throat> okay, Hayek, of course, understood competition as a discovery process, and, uh, well, we've already talked about, people have mentioned Hayek's great 1945 paper and the earlier 1937 paper where he was working th these things out. One of my favorite quotes is from The Fatal Conceit, 1988, his last work. 
Neither all ends pursued nor all means used are known or need to be known to anybody in order for them to be taken account of with a spontaneous order. Such an order forms of itself. I have seen that thousands of times in the laboratory. People do not have any difficulty. If you give them a message space, you give them some motivation, they don't have to be experienced. They don't have to be very sophisticated. They'll produce a spontaneous order, trust me. Uh, another really, I think, great paper by Hike. It was a 1968 lecture. Uh, the, the title is Competition of the Discovery Procedure. He says, I propose to consider competition as a procedure for the discovery of such facts as otherwise would not be known to anyone. Great insight. And in fact, experiments demonstrate that Hike is right about that. People discover a price that they didn't know existed. They didn't know there would be some price they would agree on. They discover it. Okay. But what does Hike say? He says, the necessary consequence of the reason why we use competition is that in those cases in which it is interesting, the validity of the theory can never be tested empirically. We can test it on conceptual models, and we might test it in artificially created real situations where the facts which competition is intended to discover are already known to the observer. Hi, you got the idea of an experiment there. Yeah, great, but what does he say? But in such cases, there'd be no practical value. So to carry out the experiment would hardly be worth it. In other words, what you would do is just discover what uh, the... Uh, was already known in terms of the theory. Okay, well, <laughs> the theory predicts what the price is, okay, and uh, that information is given to the experiment, so he just discovers that. He kind of missed the point of what might you do with this. So, but why do we do an experiment? Well, because it can fail. That's why. And that's why Hayek would want to do that limited experiment because it might fail. If it failed, he'd have to go back to the drawing board. Okay? And that's really important to be willing to expose your ideas to the possibility that you are wrong. Okay? And uh, I can't, you know, my life's been filled up with failed experiments. What happened didn't, wasn't what I expected. And here's some ins what I call inspiring, wonderful failures. Well, in the 1950s and 60s, that complete information was necessary for equilibrium of supply and demand. It's not. We went on and showed it is neither necessary nor sufficient. I can give you cases where the, the, the market flounders around with with, uh, with complete, complete information, and if it converges, it's more slowly than with incomplete. So there's a huge number of things there to be understood. And then in the 1980s, uh, the belief that, equilibrium, that complete information asset market experiments would not bubble. See, we'd done these flow, supply, and demand experiments and did a lot of generalization of those. And we decided, well, let's, let's look at asset market trading. And, uh, you know, let's, let's see if we can create an environment where uh, uh, bubbles would form. Okay, we need to do a baseline. And the baseline will be in one where there is no bubble. And so the baseline, I'm not going to go into detail, but it we thought we were creating a an incredibly transparent environment that it would be very obvious and we were kind of telling people and leaning on them about what uh, the fundamental value was. They bubbled. And we were flabbergasted. They're, they're, they're bubbling and it, it, this is transparent. No, it, it doesn't mean... <laughs> Yes, it was transparent, but hope springs eternal that you can make capital gains by, uh, <laughs> by buying now and selling high later. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, 
So a program that was going to establish a baseline with no bubbles <clears throat> and then see if we could create a bubble turned into a program to figure out why these guys are bubbling. <clears throat> and it goes away with experience. Unfortunately, you can't take the great <clears throat> uh, the bubble, housing bubble, from 1997 uh, to 2006, collapsing in 2007, you can't rerun it so the people get practice, uh, get experience. <clears throat> and of course, that housing mortgage market, a bubble, and what was behind it involved a lot of, of incentive incompatibilities. It's loaded up with them. For example, up front fees for originating a loan. Wow, did that ever give you a, a, lot of, a lot of loans? Got what people call predatory pricing. Why are they out there predating? Because they get a fee up front, that's why. Our proposal in our book, uh, Rethinking Housing Bubbles, I'll, I'll put in a plug for that just out in last June. Our proposal is that the if there's an upfront if there's a fee, let it be determined by the market, but whatever that fee is, spread it over the life of the loan in proportion to the payment of principal. Okay, escrow it in to the payments. So if Countrywide wants to make an interest only loan, that's okay, but uh, for, and no payment of principal for 10 years, you don't get any fee for 10 years. You're perfectly free to do that. Let the market figure out whether loan origination should be separated from lending, but give them the same incentives that a lender would have. Now, is that foolproof? Can't be sure. It sounds good. I think it's incentive compatible. Eric could prove that it is, I'm sure. <laughs> but, I but I would want to try it. I would want to try it because I just, I, you know, I made so many mistakes that I'm afraid I would make another one. Um, okay, and then uh, in the 1990s, we believed that cooperation would fail in the trust game ex experiments we were running. It, it didn't. Uh, you know, no player ones were supposed to move to uh, move to players twos because they could take all the money uh, as well as share it in a way so that there were big gains for both. Uh, so they weren't supposed to do that. Well, half the subjects, player ones, moved past the player twos. And two-thirds to three-quarters of the second players did not take all the money. They reciprocated. And Interesting, uh, undergraduates uh, did well in that experiment. Graduate students did well in that experiment. We, we put faculty in it, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> they made less money and took longer to make the decisions than the undergraduates and the graduates, okay? I don't know what they were thinking about. It's kind of a no-brainer what you do uh, if, if you use, follow the the usual stuff. So people pretty are pretty good on the ground for uh, using whatever their 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 mental equipment is and their experience to solve these problems. Okay, I want to uh, give end here with two perspectives on intellectual history. Uh, one is that I didn't introduce. I got credit for introducing the double auction into uh, into economics. I didn't really do it, it von Bawerk did. I didn't know about this. He introduced the double auction into economics. Read his fabulous account of the multiple buyer, multiple seller horse auction. Horse auction, okay, this is, this is 1891. Uh, but, but, but the problem is no one noticed. <laughs> and, and that had no influence on me. That's something I discovered later. And then the second thing I want to mention is what I call Adam Smith's discovery axiom. It's the propensity to truck, barter, and exchange. Really interesting, Adam Smith did not begin with preferences, technology, resources. He didn't begin with any of that. 
he began with the propensity, the, uh, the thing that was, that he observed everybody around him doing, and that's propensity to truck barter and exchange. That was his primitive. And, well, turns out that enables preferences, technology, resources, specialization, all those things to be discovered. It's what Hayek was talking about, what is Israel was talking about earlier today. Uh, and it's right there in Adam Smith. Uh, people have a propensity to trade. They exchange. Now there's a price. Uh, either, if the price is not public, you'll learn about it through gossip. Okay? Gossip is older than trade. Uh, once there's a price out there for corn and there's a price for hogs, you can make calculations. In principle, you could do all these calculations. In principle, you could do all of this. But boy, you've given a price out there. You can start to ask yourself questions. Should I be growing more corn and fewer hogs? Or more hogs and less corn? You can start to ask questions you would not have asked yourself without the presence of those prices. That's the idea. Uh, so for Smith, Hayek, and Julian Simon, I, I anticipated that I guess that Julian Simon would be mentioned. Wow. Anyway, uh, and uh, causality was from markets to the discovery of human knowledge how. And here's Adam Smith. Without the disposition to truck barter and exchange, every man must have procured to himself every necessary and conveniency of life which he wanted, and there could have been no such difference of employment as could have given occasion to any great difference of talents. That's the discovery of, of that's human knowledge, okay? Talents and, and can do. So Smith had the right direction, causal, causality, you see. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Okay, so we'll open it up for questions. Again, uh, please uh, get the mics and uh, state your name and affiliation and state your question clearly at the panelists. <clears throat> Professor Smith, I was surprised when the last quote here. It seems to me that Smith here is agreeing with Rousseau that specialization causes the difference in talents, whereas I thought, think the Germans had it more right, that it is the difference in natural talents that leads to specialization. Or am I misinterpreting what you're meaning to imply here by citing Smith here? Uh, was there a question? Yes, I'm saying, do you, do you agree with this interpretation that, that Smith is saying here, that talents come oh, from yes. the specialization? Yes, yes. And he's got beautiful examples. He, um, by the way, David Hume and Adam Smith both use the word experiment, not very often, but occasionally. And what's an experiment? It's a case. It's an example. You need to test your system and your thinking against uh, observations. And that's an experiment, okay? Uh, oh yes, and, and Adam Smith's examples are terrific, and and the uh, and, and elaborating on uh, on uh, his point, he said that you know a street porter and a, a common street porter and a philosopher has very young children. They may have been playmates. They're growing up, and gradually. The education, circumstances, and the choices they make, they start to diverge. 
and one becomes a philosopher and the other a, a, uh, ends up being a, a street porter. porter. And uh, only the vanity of the philosopher recognizes that they started out the same. Uh, so it's about the, the decisions and choices that people make uh, based upon prices and calculations they can make and, and, and what it is they like or don't like. That's the process that, that Adam Smith was, was talking about and that Hayek and, and Israel was talking about earlier today. Hi, I'm Tim Cavanaugh from National Review. Um, Professor Smith, for you talking about uh, in, you know incentives not being lined up, uh, can you comment at all on where we stand today? I, I would, you know, thinking of both of interest rates and in many cases of insurance, uh, as you know, there are lots of subsidies for uh, flood insurance and things like that. We have subsidies now for healthcare uh, and, and you know and non uh, rates set at a central office. Same thing for interest rates, which are not really reflective of the risk that uh, a lender is taking. Where does that uh, leave us? I mean, are, do, those, do, in, do incentives exist in, in those two areas? Well, you're talking about systems that are filled up with incentive incompatibilities. And uh, they're not asking Eric here how to think this through. They didn't ask Leo Hurwitch uh, uh, back when he was doing this. And, and the, the, the incentives of the individual have to be compatible with what the, the social goals are. And when they're not, you can have a, a disaster. And, uh, you know, it's hard to get people... Uh, uh, um, the regula regulations tend to... Like predatory lending, there's all kinds of, they're, they're trading, want to do something about the symptoms, not ask why it is that somebody is, uh, is trying to force a loan on somebody else, you see. And, and, when it, and if they did, you'd find it out. All he's doing is what it, it is, it's in his interest to do. And well, that, that doesn't make it moral. I mean, he may be doing immoral things, but you know, let, let's kind of help people be moral by by uh, trying to get the ins the the, the incentives, incentives of the individual better aligned with the kind of of outcomes that we hope to have. Very hard to do because you know politicians can't. It's it's hard to describe that to the voter so that you can get votes. And uh, I think there probably are cases of, of, of uh, very innovative politicians that can, that can find a way to bootleg this stuff in and, and make it sound good. I don't know how to do it, but that, 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 would, be entrepreneur, that would be political entrepreneurship. Somebody who had his his eye nicely focused on where he wants to be, and then I find a way to talk about it so that uh, he could win votes. Ivan? Ivan Progress at Hillsdale College. So I'm wondering about this predatory uh, loan stuff. Um, your proposal to spread the fee over the life of the loan it's not really necessary if you don't have pre-selling of loans, right, mortgage loans through Fannie and Freddie. If a bank that issues the loan actually has to hold on to that loan, it's not going to be issuing loans that are likely to fail. So it seems to me that there is a simpler solution, which is to get rid of Fannie and Freddie and not have these resales, right? That would make an incentive compatible. Oh, just hand the mic to Arnold. That sounds a good, like a good one for you, Eric. <laughs> well, 
I, I don't want to comment on, uh, on Freddie and Fanny. Uh, I mean that, I'm not a, uh, uh, a housing market expert and I don't want to, uh, to pretend to be one. But, but I do want to make a, um, a, a general comment about uh, regulation of financial markets. Uh, one thing that we learned from the, uh, from the financial disaster of, uh, of six years ago uh, was something that economic theorists had been talking about for years, which is that financial markets are riddled with externalities. Uh, it, in, in particular, uh, if I'm a bank and I'm making risky loans, uh, I have an incentive if I can, to, uh, to make those loans using other people's money. In other words, to, to make highly leveraged loans. But when I do that, I don't take into account the fact that if the loan goes bad, it's not just me who fails, but all of my creditors. In other words, the, I, I am creating systemic risk by making these loans on, on borrowed money. That, that's an externality which I have no incentive as, as a bank to, to take into account. And the only way that that uh, externality will be taken into account is if someone else, a regulator for example, uh, puts a limit on leverage. Um, that's a simple lesson from economic theory that was, that was ignored six years ago. Um, I hope it won't continue to be ignored. L let me just say that... I do want to comment on to, to me, uh, we, we use the language regulation or deregulation, but I don't think that's, that's uh, it's unfortunate language. It's really about property rights. What should be your rights to take action? And uh, we've, the, the supply and demand experiments that I did and I was talking about, those are involve markets for non-durable goods and services is, is really what's going on there. They're perishables. Why? Because the buyer makes a purchase and writes down his, his gain in the experiment, writes down his profits from that purchase. A seller writes down uh, his profit if he makes a sale. Uh, and notice that in those experiments, before you go to market, you know whether you're a buyer or a seller. You already know that. Uh, well, when's the last time did, that you went to the hamburger market to sell one? Or went to the haircut market to sell one? Some of you. I mean, you go to buy. I mean, you, you know in advance. You don't, you don't switch your role depending upon the price. We're talking about goods that are not retradable. They're final consumption things, and it's not trivial. It's 75% of private product has that characteristic. All the trouble in the economy comes from the other 25%, mostly housing and mortgage, the stuff you can retrade. You see, that's, that's, that's the stuff that causes all kinds of trouble when we talk about the miracle of markets, we should understand that that miracle already works for 75% of private products. Okay? No problem there. It's this other stuff. It's hard to get the, 
the, in, the incentives right and, 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 and hold them still because there's always incentives to go out there and make it easier for people of modest means to own a home so we can make them rich until the market turns around and then they're in negative equity. <laughs> All right, Arnold has the mic now and then we'll go to George. Um, I was listening to Professor Mask and listening to your talk and, and the, your description of the proofs I, that I markets. Uh, Arnold, we can't hear you. I can't hear a word you're saying. Yeah. Uh, sing it out. <laughs> okay. Um, li listening to P Professor Maskin's talk and the about the proofs that markets sort of satisfy Hayek's two concerns. It struck me that, you know, in light of you know this morning's talk, that those proofs had very closed end sort of descriptions of the world. You know, that lots of information I think is, is known, a lot more than I think Hayek had in mind being known, um, or certainly that I would have in mind being known. If I can say that. And um, so my question is sort of, you know, methodologically, is there a way? to even talk about mechanism design in a world where lots of things are unknown, including like you know, future technology and so on? Or is, or is there an inevitable conflict between trying to do these sorts of proofs and trying to deal in the world that Israel Kersner was talking about, the, the world that's more open-ended? Very, very good question. Uh, I think the answer is yes, there is a way to, to capture the open-endedness of an economic system. And, 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 and the way that the papers that I mentioned have done this is to suppose that no individual in the economy knows what the state of the world is. There, 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 there is a state of the world that if we were omniscient, uh, we would know. And, and this state uh, would allow us to know what future technology is and to know what uh, other people's preferences are and to know what uh, productive capacities are. But no one knows these things. Uh, what the what the mechanism does, however, is to allow people to exchange information through a system of prices, through some other uh, d discovery mechanism, and, and thereby uh, introduce our collective knowledge into, uh, into that system. So, so, so th think of what prices do. Pri prices not only uh, serve as individual signals to individual consumers and producers, but also aggregate information. Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, as, a, as a seller, uh, how much people are going to demand or what, uh, or even perhaps what technology I should use in uh, making the goods that, that people will la later buy. But uh, prices, which aggregate uh, this information that I don't know are uh, are going to uh, to give me the answers to those questions. So that, so that's what uh, the the Jordan and Hammond and 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 uh, many subsequent uh, models are allowing for the 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 aggregative po uh, possibilities. Uh, of a uh, uh, 
of an economic mechanism. Uh, individuals don't know, but the but collectively, uh, what their their dispersed information gets aggregated. George is going to have to be the last question. So it's all right with me. <laughs> <laughs> My question is also for Professor Maskin, and it is simply. Uh, how how uh, you, you arrive at the conclusion that the housing uh, subprime boom was evidence of a market failure as someone who professedly doesn't uh, claim to be an expert on housing markets or to even have an opinion of what role Fannie and Freddie played in them. Isn't that something of a non sequitur? When I say I'm... I'm not an expert, and, and I'm not. Um, I, um, I'm suggesting I should stay out of details such as what particular government programs should or should not exist. One doesn't have to be an expert in financial markets, though, to know that there are huge externalities in those markets. And simple economic theory, the, the economic theory that, that we teach our first year graduate students is enough to tell us that those markets left unregulated unreg will not work very well. So I'm not proposing the solution, <laughs> but I can diagnose the problem. Okay. <laughs> I may. I think a closer look at what Fannie and Freddie did might change your mind about whether those mortgages would ever have been created in such volumes if that agency weren't prepared to buy them all. It doesn't matter what government does, whether markets are functioning as one wants them to or you, otherwise. You, you won't get any objection from me on the point that it matters what government does. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, 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 I can't resist. Uh, I've been quiet. But uh, many, many, uh, many years ago, I was actually at a, a conference with Pete Leeson, and, and uh, Ann Kruger said, look, look, we all love the market. What we need is reasonable regulation that's not capturable by interest. And, 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 and I raised my hand, and I said, what if that's a null set? And then Andre Schleifer, who was there, your colleague, he chuckled and said, why are you so unreasonable? <laughs> so, but the, the, the question never got answered. And I think from a public choice point of view, so the question that I raised before, which I think is very valuable, is the connection between the public choice perspective and also the mechanism de design perspective is that we have to look at the incentive compatibilities on both sides of the market right. here. And I think that's like the real, one of the real questions is you can talk about these counterparty contagions and other kind of externalities, but then, you know, what is the mechanism for the regulator to actually be aligned? What are their incentives to align correctly? So, a thanks. Absolutely. So, so uh, too, too much of regulatory theory ignores the fact that regulators themselves need incentives, yeah. and, and a proper regulatory system must take that into account. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> if you uh, just bear with me for two, two quick points before you uh, leave the room. Uh, I want to uh, thank, uh, give another opportunity to thank my colleagues um, at George Mason University and Mercatus, in particular Claire Morgan, who I work very closely with at the Hayek program, and as well as the staff here um, for, uh, for uh, uh, you know, at Mercatus. And in particular, again, I would like it if we could um, thank, again, I won't list all of them, but in the back of your program, there's a list of the various different financial supporters um, that have made this conference possible. So I uh, personally want to thank all of you uh, for the work that you've done, and uh, it's a Great pleasure of me to thank you for that. So thank you. <laughs> and then, uh, and finally, I would like to uh, thank Professor Maskin and Professor Smith for their insightful and stimulating discussion um, this afternoon and uh, for their example uh, for the sort of life of scholarship and 
uh, exploration that we hope that we communicate to all of our people in the economics community here at George Mason. So thank you very much.